So in this video, we're going to talk about supraventricular tachycardias, also known as SVTs. So we'll go over how to organize the different SVTs, and then in the second part of the talk, we'll go through some algorithms of how to manage a patient with a suspected SVT, both in the acute and chronic settings. So what is an SVT? So we can draw the heart here. These are the ventricles down here, and these are the atria. You have an SA node here and an AV node here. So supraventricular tachycardias, they're going to occur above the ventricle. And they are a group of arrhythmias that arise from the atrial tissue or the AV node. And because impulses are conducted down the AV node without any issues, usually on ECG, you're going to see a narrow tachycardia. So keep in mind, SVTs can sometimes look wide on ECG if there's something else going on, such as a bundle branch block. All right, so how do we organize the SVTs? If you got a patient with a narrow and fast rhythm, the first thing you wanna decide is whether or not this rhythm is regular or irregular. So we can draw regular over here. And then irregular here. So let's talk about irregular first. So irregular narrow and fast rhythms include AFib, and also multifocal atrial tachycardia, MAT. Going over on the regular side, so this is regular, narrow, and fast. We've got our just plain old sinus tach. And then we also have AVNRT, We've got AVRT, and then we also have something called atrial tachycardia. And atrial tachycardia is basically when there's a group of cells in the atrium outside of the SA node that have increased automaticity, and that can cause a regular narrow tachycardia. And kind of in between regular and irregular, we've got a flutter. So this is AFib's cousin. And sometimes a flutter can look quite regular on ECG. So usually students aren't too confused about the irregular rhythms. And it seems to be the regular rhythms that confuse people. And in particular, these two. So you get a lot of questions about AVNRT versus AVRT, and rightfully so, it's a confusing topic. So these both are similar in that they are re-entrant tachycardias. Usually there's um, some sort of re-entrant circuit. But the difference lies in the fact that AVNRT, the re-entry circuit, is going to be in the AV node. Whereas for AVRT, you have a re-entry circuit outside of the AV node. So the classic example would be WPW, where you've got your accessory bundle of Kent that's not going um, through the AV node. And another thing I wanted to know is that technically, all of these rhythms are SVTs because they are supraventricular and they are tachycardias. However, oftentimes when people say SVTs, and you might hear this on the words, what they are referring to are the paroxysmal SVTs. And these would be these three, and these are, these are the three most common paroxysmal SVTs. And about 60% of patients with paroxysmal SVTs are going to have an AVNRT, about 30% will have an AVRT, and then another 10% will have atrial tach. 
So let's talk about the acute management SVTs. So if you have a patient coming in with tachycardia, so they have increased heart rate, and you suspect they might have an SVT, the first thing you want to ask is whether or not this patient is stable. Now, if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, the next step is going to be cardioversion. So you would shock these patients. If they are stable, then you can take a look at their ECG. And in particular, we want to know if the QRX complexes are wide versus narrow. So for wide complex tachycardias, you kind of do a different set of things, so we can talk about that another time. In this lecture, we're going to focus on the narrow tachyarrhythmias. So then if you decide you have a narrow tachycardia, the next step is whether it is regular or irregular. So the irregular rhythms are AFibs or multifocal atrial tachycardias. And for those, you also do a different set of actions. So we'll talk about that in another lecture. So if you have a regular, narrow, and fast rhythm, the next step that you want to do is try vagal maneuvers. So these are things like carotid sinus massage, Valsalva, or you can put an ice pack to a patient's face. And oftentimes this gets them out of their rhythm, but if there's no effect, then at this point you can try IV adenosine. So IV adenosine is going to act really quickly. It has AV nodal blocking effects that can hopefully interrupt the re-entry circuit and have the patients convert back to sinus rhythm. But if this also has no effect, then we can try drugs such as dotizem, so dilt, we can try verapamil, or beta blockers. So these are, or it's gonna be IV beta blockers. So these are all IV drugs that can offer additional AV blockade. And if finally that has no effect as well, that's when you would resort to the antiarrhythmics. Now you guys are not going to be responsible for knowing which antiarrhythmics to pick. That's going to be beyond the scope of this course and what you need to know at this point in your life. I will tell you guys that usually they pick a 1C or class class 1C or class 3 antiarrhythmic. So really, you do not resort to antiarrhythmics until you've tried all of these things and that there's no effect. So one thing I do want to mention is that if you have an SVT with pre-excitation, that's when the ventricles depolarize earlier than expected, and the classic example is with WPW, then you do not want to give any of these AV nodal blocking drugs because this can be associated with accelerated conduction down the accessory tract and this can actually precipitate a ventricular arrhythmia. So what you want to do for a suspected SVT with pre-excitation, and these will look wide, right? you would go ahead and do antiarrhythmics and oftentimes they like to pick procainamide or fluconide. So I want to talk briefly about the chronic management of SVTs. You want to see whether or not the patient who came in with SVT has evidence of pre-excitation. If they do, then these are great candidates for catheter ablation. So you go ahead and refer them to EP or an electrophysiologist.
if they do not have any evidence of pre-excitation. And this was their first episode ever, and it responded well to vague overneighbors. There's really no other complicating factors to the case. Then oftentimes these patients can just go home with no therapy. If, on the other hand, this is a recurrent thing for the patient, they've had multiple episodes of SVTs, you may want to initiate prophylactic treatment. And the first line is where we would start with either a beta blocker, verapamil, dotizem, or digoxin. Now, if these patients are on one or a combination of these drugs and they come back, then at this time, we can also consider ablation. Though if for whatever reason, they're not a good candidate for ablation or they don't give consent, then there are some things we can do to medically optimize them. And at this point, we would we could give a class 1C or a class 3 antiarrhythmic as prophylaxis. So you can see it's pretty similar to the acute management in that antiarrhythmics are kind of your last resort once you've exhausted everything else. All right, and that's SVTs. Thanks for listening.